formed to be one of the most successful pro-American conservative organizations fighting for the very ends that Sheriff Mack is talking about. May I present Ms. Phyllis Shaffley. Thank you very much, Mark, and thank you, dear friends, and thank you, Arlene, for bringing together California Eagle Farm. You're doing a great job. Let's give Arlene a big hand. Uh, the sheriff has uh, given me a hard act to follow, uh, but we need to shift gears and take up another issue. And I guess I'm the one in the country who is willing to take on the whole issue of feminism, which has now become a hot topic, uh, probably due to Sarah Palin and the way that the feminists are attacking her all the time. Now, there's no legal or dictionary definition of feminism uh, that is binding. You can call yourself a feminist and define it any way you want. But when I talk about feminism, I use it the way the leaders of the movement have used it. Beginning with uh, Betty Friedan, who started this current movement in 1963 with her book, The Feminine Mystique. And other uh, leaders like Bella Abzug and Gloria Steinem. They gathered their forces together by the technique they called the consciousness raising session. They would get a bunch of women together and they would exchange their tales about how badly some man had treated them. And grievances are like flowers, if you water them they will grow. And little grievances grew into big grievances. And uh, she built a movement that way. And in those days, they didn't call themselves feminists. They called themselves the women's liberation movement. So you have to ask, what did they want to be liberated from? It's pretty clear they wanted to be liberated from home, husband, family, and children. Friedan called the home that the housewife lived in a comfortable concentration camp. She called her a parasite because she wasn't out uh, working in the workforce. Uh, the best book on this subject was written by Carolyn Gralia, who showed clearly by reading all those tiresome books written by the feminists that their main goal was the degradation of the full-time homemaker. And that hasn't changed. That was confirmed by Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who wrote in her book, that the concept of husband, breadwinner, wife, homemaker must be eliminated. She's on the Supreme Court. They haven't changed. It wasn't very long ago that Gloria Steinem said on television that when a woman gets married, she becomes a semi-non-person. Of course, in later life, she did get married, but she said the only reason she got married was to put her boyfriend on her health plan because he had an illness. Simone de Beauvoir, who is known as the big mama of women's lib, the French woman who wrote The Second Sex, said that marriage was an obscene bourgeois institution. Of course, she didn't know anything about marriage. She was never married. And she said, we can't give women the choice of being in the workforce or being a full-time homemaker, because if we did, too many of them would pick to be in the home. Feminists have said that the litmus test of being a feminist today is belief in abortion. So they are a bunch of unhappy women who uh, didn't know how to deal with their own problems and decided that to look for the government uh, to be uh, their solution. They don't believe that women can be successful. You never hear the feminists talking about Margaret Thatcher or Condoleezza Rice or uh, Carly Fiorina or uh, uh, they do, of course, talk about Sarah Palin, but only to attack her. But by any standard, she certainly is a successful woman. And you know, the one man who does understand and has always understood feminism is Rush Limbaugh. 
He said the other way, other day, the reason the feminists hate hair, Sarah, is first she's successful, and then she's pretty, and then she likes men, and then she has her man who likes her. And all together, they simply can't stand it. Uh, yet I think the tide is turning, and you know, in uh, last year in the election, uh, a lot of women were elected. And funny thing, uh, they were nearly all Republicans and nearly all pro-life. It was a great victory. Now, one of these uh, modern feminists named Jessica Valenti uh, wrote in the Washington Post a few weeks ago uh, the definition of feminism. She said, it, it is an ide ideology that the world oppresses women and the patriarchy must end. So that's their vision, it's the class war. Many of these women, like uh, Friedan and Abzug, had Marxist training as they were uh, growing up and becoming adults. And the class war is uh, setting one class against another. So the purpose of the feminists is to paint women as victims. Uh, the now, the National Organization for Women used to run an ad that showed a darling curly-headed child and the caption under the picture was, this normal healthy child was born with a handicap. She was born female. So that's the starting assumption. Now when I talk to the college campuses, I talk on a lot of subjects, but they really like me to talk on feminism because that's what brings the crowd out. Uh, the Women's Studies Department always shows up. They spend all afternoon trying to think up hostile questions. But at any rate, I like to tell a joke. And um, my uh, friend, uh, who was the, probably the greatest speaker of the previous generation, Everett Dirksen of Illinois, used to say that he never thought a joke was really good until he had told a hundred times. And I've probably told this a hundred times, but I like to tell it because it enables me to find out how many feminists I have in the audience. The feminists don't laugh. They have no sense of humor. But it's the story about the, uh, the news came over the wires uh, that the world will end at noon tomorrow. And the New York Times gave it a serious headline, world will end at noon tomorrow, details on pages five through eight. And the Wall Street Journal gave it a bigger headline, a world will end at noon tomorrow, stock market will close early. And USA Today uh, gave it a very colorful front page, world will end at noon tomorrow, see our survey on what people think about this. <laughs> but the Washington Post gave it a big black headline, world will end at noon tomorrow, women and minorities hardest hit. <laughs> I don't think we have many feminists here tonight. Uh, but at any rate, the feminists uh, were always talking about liberation. And in the 1960s, they wanted liberation from divorce. So they helped put through these uh, unilateral divorce bills all across the country. And then in the 1970s, uh, they uh, tried to uh, uh, ratify the Equal Rights Amendment, which turned into a, a big fight that we carried on with everybody against us, and we finally beat them in a 10-year battle, uh, which was a great event. And in the 1980s, their, uh, their uh, uh, goal was uh, daycare. You see, the feminists think that society's expectation that, uh, that uh, women are expected to take care of their own babies is an example of the patriarchy oppressing us. And so they think the government should take over this responsibility. And it's pretty funny when Bernie Goldberg wrote his book Bias about CBS, he said the biggest story you will never see on CBS television is what's wrong with daycare because the feminists who work for CBS will not let it on. So many of them are dropping off their kid at uh, seven in the morning and picking up the kid at seven at night, and they're not gonna allow anything on that shows there anything the matter with that. Now, <clears throat> they have one uh, conservative professor at Harvard. His name is Harvey Mansfield. And uh, he really got it all together in one sentence when he said that this feminist movement is anti-men, anti-male, anti-masculine, anti-marriage, anti-motherhood, and anti-morality. 
And that really does uh, sum, it up, sum it up. The feminist movement was never about equality. They are for interchangeability of the sexes. They try to tell you that there isn't any difference between men and women, and all those differences you think you see are just a social construct brought about by their uh, old-fashioned parents who uh, inflicted stereotyped upbringing on their children by such terrible things as giving dolls to girls and trucks to boys. Now, I uh, read and wrote the other day, uh, it's one of my latest columns on uh, eagleform.org, about this school over in Oakland, which put on a two-day gender identity course with a special curriculum designed for each class, kindergarten through high school. And this was designed to tell kids that people can choose to be different from the sex they are assigned at birth and can, can freely change their sex. These people came into the school and told fourth graders that if they are born with male private parts but identified more with being a girl, they should be accepted and respected. These characters taught what they called gender fluidity. It's okay to be a boy one day and a girl the next. Now why are you surprised? This is what they're teaching in all these women's studies courses. For years they have taught that the obvious differences we think you, we see are just a, a social construct. Uh, that uh, being a male or female is not a natural occurrence, but it's the conditioning by our old-fashioned stereotyped uh, uh, upbringing. And, uh, of course, the feminists think that the nastiest four-letter word in the English language is role, R-O-L-E. They think there are no roles for men or for we and for women. And really, they are at war with human nature because we all know there are obvious differences. Uh, we could recite them for the next hour, but I'll just mention one. Uh, rich men are fatter than poor men, but rich women are thinner than poor women. And uh, about 99% uh, of the people with anorexia are women. Funny thing. And we know that about 95% of the work, of the injuries on the job are sustained by men. That's not because they're uh, clumsier than women. Uh, that's because women are, uh, men are willing to take these uh, dangerous jobs to support their families that women simply will not take at any price. Now the feminists have given a lot of uh, publicity to the Maria Shriver report, which is now bragging that we live in a woman's nation. And she said, and women are now at the head of the table. I guess she's at the head of her table now. And uh, however, the National Bureau of Economic Research has reported that despite uh, all of this movement and everything it alleges it has brought about, women on the whole are less happy than they were in the 1950s. Now, I would suggest to you that these people are wrong who say that we can separate uh, the social issues from the cultural issues. One uh, a presidential candidate who has since withdrawn uh, said that we should uh, put uh, the social issues in the deep freeze, I think he said, or put them on the back burner uh, because uh, we should devote ourselves only to the fiscal issues. Uh, but that is impossible because the cultural and fiscal issues are really in an embrace that cannot be separated. And the reason is that the attack on marriage and the ab marriage absent in this country is not only the biggest cultural issue in this country, but it is the biggest fiscal issue that we can do something about. We have an enormous uh, hostility toward marriage by the feminists. Uh, we have the bias of the family courts against fathers. Uh, but we have taxpayer-paid financial incentives against 
um, marriage. Now somebody here tonight was passing out buttons that say follow the money and uh, I think the older I get the more I think follow the money uh, explains most everything that's going on. And we the generous taxpayers uh, have been giving financial incentives to illegitimacy in this country so that last year this country nationally had a 41 percent illegitimacy rate in this country. It is a national disaster and it's pretty obvious uh, when the women don't have the husband and father to be the provider they look to big brother government and that is what is supporting them and the children. It was 45 years ago that a liberal in the Lyndon Johnson administration named Daniel Patrick Moynihan uh, wrote a rather famous uh, book, pamphlet, called The Negro Family, The Case for National Action. And he showed how the welfare plan payments were breaking up the black families that had all been together, were not taken apart by the poverty of the Great Depression but they were blown apart by the financial subsidies which were designed by the welfare system to go to the women, making the husband and father irrelevant. At that time, the illegitimacy rate was only 6%. Well, today, it's no longer just the blacks. It's the whites who have a 29% illegitimacy rate last year. And the studies have all been compiled by Robert Rector of the Heritage Foundation. The government is transferring nearly a trillion dollars a year to the breakup of marriage, mostly to the single moms who are getting all of these payments, tax-funded uh, payments that come in 77 different varieties and types of uh, of handouts and they include all all sorts of things not only welfare but it's it's housing supplements it's medicaid it's a school lunch uh, it's all kinds of these handouts which go to uh, the single moms it is the lack of marriage that causes poverty the poverty for single parents with children is now running at 37 percent but it's only 60, only 6% for married couples with children. And we're giving out the highest number of food stamps ever in our history. The, uh, the handouts that go in addition to housing subsidies and food stamps and Medicaid, there's daycare, there's the EITC, uh, which could run as high as uh, over $5,000 a year, uh, the WIC plan, the S-CHIP plan, and all of these various 77 different handouts. When Obama said to Joe the plumber that he was going to spread the wealth around, he really meant it. And this is the biggest way he is spreading the wealth around today. A recent article by Thomas Sowell, one of our favorite columnists, said that entitlement is just a fancy word for dependency. And Reagan's advice is certainly still pertinent. He said, if you subsidize something, you're going to get more of it. If you tax it, you will get less of it. Now, back in 1993, Charles Murray identified illegitimacy as the single most important social problem of our time because it drives everything else. And uh, it's at the top of our fiscal problems today. You and I grew up when we had a society uh, where husbands and fathers were the provider. But now we had 1.7 million out of wedlock babies born last year. And their mothers looked to government as their provider. So the left is uh, very uh, willing to let this uh, condition persist because the liberals, the Democrats, and Obama all know which side their bread is buttered on. Seventy percent of unmarried women voted for Obama in when he became president of the United States. And uh, restoring a marriage society is the only way that we can uh, make a difference. They even put a marriage penalty in Obamacare. And the 
uh, the uh, Wall Street Journal reporter went to the staffer on Capitol Hill who wrote that in to Obamacare and said, why did you do that? instead of giving uh, the same kind of break to married couples. And the Democratic staffer answered, and I quote, as it was quoted in the Wall Street Journal, you have to decide what your goals are. And they have decided what their goals are. The people who are dependent on government are going to be voting for the liberal, the Democratic candidate. Now they understand that. Uh, because one of their smartest people is a man named John Podesta, who was an advisor to Bill Clinton and now is an advisor to Barack Obama, and he has his own C3 think tank called the Center for American Progress. He has put out a 60-page document that uh, says that uh, he has, uh, I, I think it is 83 bills, that he's introducing to funnel more money to the single moms. He says, we are just, uh, uh, have been asserting, uh, he asserts that our definition of family is outdated and stuck in the 1950s notion of a nuclear family that excludes too many of the non-traditional arrangements that we have today. And so he's got these 83 pieces of legislation that are designed to benefit unmarried women with kids. Uh, he repeats the falsehood that women learn, earn only 77 cents for every dollar a man makes, which is just a complete and total lie. He wants to expand the definition of marriage to include uh, anybody who's living together. He wants them to be able to cash in on the handouts. He wants um, more generous family leave laws with pay, paid sick days, uh, to expand the, uh, the uh, uh, handouts for alleged uh, domestic violence. The Democrats, of course, repealed the last year the welfare reform that the Republican Congress voted uh, in 1997. So all of these uh, areas are w the way that the liberals and the Obama administration are building their constituency of dependency on government. We now have almost a split country, country uh, with nearly half of the American people not paying income taxes. And if they're not paying income taxes and they're getting federal handouts, uh, that is coming from the 50% of Americans who do pay federal income tax. And when I talk about these figures, we do not include Social Security and Medicare or any programs that people pay into. We're only including the cash handouts that are given uh, to the people uh, who are completely dependent on government. So it's no surprise that married women vote Republican while single mothers vote Democratic. They need Big Brother to be their provider. Even a new book by an editorial writer for the Wall Street Journal starts off with the line, who's going to look after my kids while I'm at work? Well, it's up to the government to provide the answer to that question. Now, the feminists, I also need to point out uh, about their anti-male, anti-masculine attitude. And it starts in the elementary grades. Uh, the elementary grades are, are dominated by women, many of whom are now feminists and union members where they espouse the whole feminist line. And they look upon little boys in the elementary uh, grades as just unruly girls. And they're trying to make them behave like girls. And little boys, I, I'd like somebody to make a survey about how many of these teachers have had sons of their own. And I bet it's a pretty small percentage. Because anybody who has had sons and daughters knows that little boys have to get up and run around and wrestle with each other so they can come back in and sit down and learn something. And they simply cannot sit at a desk with pen and paper for the hours that little girls can. So many of the schools have simply eliminated recess. I learned recently that the Chicago public school system hasn't had recess for years. Now, uh, when the little boys don't behave like little girls, then the answer is to give them Ritalin. Now, this, uh, this anti-masculine attitude continues into college. 
And the beginning with the feminists in the Carter administration, they have gone on a rampage to eliminate men's sports in colleges. And uh, they do this because they're anti-men and anti-masculine. And in particular, they have gotten colleges to eliminate 467 wrestling teams. Now you tell me what good that does for women. It's the cheapest sport you can have. All you need is a mat. So it's not a matter of money. It's simply a matter of feeding their anti-masculine attitude because they hate anything that shows that men are masculine and different. My inbox and my email is filled with uh, 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 messages from Brown students today saying, please help us save our wrestling team. We have a lot of high school champions on the wrestling team and the feminists are about to cancel it. Uh, so uh, that's one of the ways that they're carrying out uh, their uh, anti-masculine um, attitudes and uh, policies, and they're getting by with it. Uh, one very brave judge, Judge Robert Durker, uh, wrote a book in which he showed that the claims of sexual harassment in the workplace have become the means by which feminists, feminists vent their malice toward men. And he had lots of cases of uh, false charges uh, in the workplace and simply done vindictively uh, by the feminists. Now everybody needs to understand that the female left has made its alliance with the Obama administration. It is a political movement that uh, helped to elect Obama and will try to elect him again. The very first thing Obama did after he became a pr president was to get Congress to pass and to sign the Lilly Ledbetter Law, a feminist goal which enables feminists in the workforce to sue for discrimination that happened 40 years ago after everybody involved was dead. And it's the first thing he did. Uh, when he uh, took office. And then I told you about what he did in Obamacare. Then when he announced his stimulus uh, jobs package, he talked about shovel-ready jobs. And we all had pictures of men in hard hats uh, repair, repairing our highways and our infrastructure. Well, the feminists had a tantrum. They demanded a meeting with the Obama administration. They demanded when they had the meeting, they would sit in a semicircle without a table between them and the Obama officials. And they demanded that the women get the majority of jobs. And they did get the majority of jobs. They, that is the way they control uh, the policies of the Obama administration. And then I hope you noticed when we had this uh, fight about the budget in the House that Harry Reid said the one issue that he would shut down the whole government over was the issue of whether the Republicans took away the appropriation for Planned Parenthood. That meant more to them than any other single issue. Now that is the control of the feminists and they, the, the feminist movement is part of the left wing. They've signed up with them and uh, that's what they're trying to do. But I think the worst part about the feminists of all is that they teach young women that they are victims of the patriarchy. And if you think you're a victim, uh, you, you're not going to accomplish anything in this world. Uh, it's a matter of attitude. And uh, they teach them that they owe the feminist movement uh, for what uh, women have achieved in this country. That is absolutely ridiculous. Women can do anything they want. And this has been a wonderful country. Even Alexis de Tocqueville, who traveled our country back in uh, the 1830s and wrote commentaries that are still read today. He said, if I were asked to what the singular prosperity and growing strength of the Americans ought mainly to be attributed, I should reply to the superiority of their women. I worked my way through college and got my degree in 1944. Uh, that was long before this feminist movement got started. Uh, my mother got her uh, bachelor's degree at a great university in 1920. In that year, 
One third of the bachelor's degrees were issued to women in this country. Those opportunities have been there uh, since, uh, since anybody he here today can possibly remember. Uh, I published my first book, A, a Choice Not an Echo, self-published, sold three million copies out of my garage. <laughs> the thing is, they don't believe in success. And they have no role models of happiness. And it is very unfortunate what they're teaching young women. The, my newest book, The Flip Side of Feminism, is particularly valuable for all young women because it shows them the falseness of the feminist ideology. And it shows them how to build a life that includes marriage and children. Because the feminists are trying to get young women to all chart their lives that have no space for marriage and children. And now we know that the big majority of divorces are filed by women. They're not filed by men. And uh, we, they, they're teaching young women, you don't need men. Well, we love the men. You're wonderful. Thank you for being here tonight. But if you've got a young woman in your family, she needs this book. And we have the special uh, Eagle Forum price of, of $20 for this uh, $25 book. It would be uh, very useful. Everybody should understand feminism and the, uh, the effect that it has. Actually, to give you one more example, it was three feminists who nagged Obama to go to war in Libya, the stupidest war this country has ever fought. It was Hillary Clinton and his ambassador to the UN and his national security advisor. Those three women nagged him until he got involved in that war that we don't want to be involved in and we have no idea which side is better or who's going to win or how that's going to help us in any way. So they are very powerful in this present administration and that's one of many reasons that you hear about from other speakers about why next year could be the most important year in the life of our country. We need the activism and energy of everybody to overturn uh, the presidency and the Congress and elect a whole new crowd. And remember, that those who wait upon the Lord, Lord will rise up with wings like eagles and they will run and not be weary. And don't you dare be weary because we need every one of you for the fight next year.